be first to say thank you, Lord, for your great love for me this past week. We're very few in number today, but that's okay. We still got loud voices that we can praise God and thank Him for all He's done. So who wants to be first? I know God is blessed in each of us because we're here today. Amen. We got breath in our bodies. Amen. I look at the back of my rear view mirror and I saw her speaking about And I came up. I just swore before me and hit another car door. And so, all the speed that he had, all the hurry he was in, he had to stay there. So he crashed into somebody's back. Oh, wow. And I said, Thank you, Jesus. Because I saw it in my rear view mirror. I saw it and I just I slowed down. But he came in just like this. He just went like that. And I love that was shaking so badly, but God is mine. Amen. He had his hand around you today, didn't he? Amen. Praise God. He's got Peggy in the back. I am just thankful to be here today, and I thank God for all his praises. Thank you. Amen. I want to thank God. Um, remember last week I was telling you that sometimes when I'm sitting at my table, I can't go anywhere. And that includes to the restroom. <laughs> and this week, the Lord provided me a little partner to work with me, a new recruit that I had to train. And so I was able to go whenever I needed to. And I was it was so hard this week. So when he provided, I, I prayed, I was like, Lord, I really need some help right now. And so I was able to go to the restroom when I needed to. So I just want to praise for even the little things like that that the Lord hears and answers and cares about in our lives. I just want to take a moment to acknowledge just the Lord and his mercy and his grace. If the Lord never does a single thing from this point forward, I'm still praising him. Amen. He just still deserves my praise and my worship. So I'm not I'm not just thanking him because he did something for me. I'm thanking him because of who he is. The fact that I can speak and it's clear enough, I'm praising God for that. Because last week um, I was not in this bit of state. My voice was horrible and my body felt horrible. And I and I took it all as, okay, this is an attack against me um, and my family as well. But I still praise God even through it because I was able to see the hand of God work. I was able to hear the voice of God speaking comfort and peace. And I just, I just have to laugh because our God is good. Um, so I just share this to say, listen, for anyone that's going through a really rough time, because we're all, we all have rough moments, understand that God sees, he knows, and he actually cares. He's still with you, even in the dark, rough times. Hang in there. Do not give up hope. Do not lose your faith in him. He's still with you. Amen. You know, I'd like to thank the Lord today for wisdom. You know, um, at work, we had a, we had a um, transit, before transit, we had to put a new engine, brand new engine, great engine came from the Ford dealership. Right? When we put the engine in, I was the one who was working, the other guy who was working with me was working and kind of, you know, I helped him not again the little things and finally got it done and when we started the engine, the engine started like popping. <laughs> and you know, I tell him that something was wrong, you need to check over again. I wasn't there but you know, he went and checked on everything and he said, you know, he's still popping when he started to the same type of stuff. You know, I came and then he said he didn't say anything wrong with, 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 with the vehicle and I started the vehicle and it was popping, you know, I give a little gas and it smooths up if there was no popping. Then it idled and it started to pop again because he said, you know, it's leaking air somewhere. So um there's nothing here that we could see so i have a big computer i put my big computer and, and he told me exactly where it was leaking between the intake manifold and the traffic body 
And you know, when Saki inspected, he said, Is it normal? Oh, yeah, right here. Um, and when we took the intake off, we realized that, you know, sometimes they make things so ingenious. There's a screw to the back of the intake which he didn't see, and that screw bolt down a water outlet jacket. No, one bolt should go through the intake manifold, down through the through, through the water jacket. But they said they could have bolt through the water jacket alone. So the intake rests on that bolt. So it does pick up, so it just passes through there. So took it on, took that bolt out, run the one straight bolt, through down through both thing and Big is working fine. I picked it up yesterday. So, you know, thank God for giving us, giving me wisdom you know, to do what I do. I just want to praise each and every day. You know what I thought about? Don't all things work together. That has to work together. Anybody else for a praise? All right, Jerry, you can ask. Well, I want to thank uh, I want to thank God because sort of like um, Sister Brenda, we almost got in an accident on Friday coming back from work. Number one, it was raining, and uh, I was telling my mother one of my stories. And as I was telling the story, a car on the right of us, no blink or anything, just started coming over. And I said, uh, when she tells me, she says, I said, hey, hey, I, I just said, hey, watch out, and she swerved to the left. And I didn't realize this until I heard her retell the story. When she swerved to the left, she said, and guess what was behind us? Or what was behind me? And I said, what? And I looked in the rearview mirror, and it was a truck, but it was way back. So when she retold the story to her sister, she said that she swerved to the left without looking first. Because the guy was coming over just that fast. Um, so I want to thank God for sparing our lives. Let us see another day. And also, please keep her in prayer because during all of that, she hurt her wrist. Thanks. Okay, anybody else for a praise? All right. Happy Sabbath, family. Um, I'm just so grateful to have made it through another week. I was able to fellowship with my family. We have our Zoom meeting every Friday evening, Vespers. And my aunt did a tribute to my other aunt who passed away some years ago. And to think of how the Lord had blessed her life. She was a physician. She was also in the Army for many years. To think of how God used her in so many ways to bless so many was nothing short of amazing and inspirational to me. And I think about what I go through in life. I complain so much, you know, everything is just, you know, in a state of upheaval sometimes. But when she gave that Vesper thought about how my aunt used her life to be a blessing, that totally transformed my thinking. I said, with everything that she dealt with, and she had disabilities as well, to know that she dedicated her life to so many, and as far as I know, she never complained. No, okay. And then here I am doing what I need to do. One thing goes wrong, old days run. But I just retrained my thinking and said, well, thank you, Lord, for that message, because I know now that in spite of every difficulty we go through, God is still faithful. And he is so willing to use us in whatever way he deems necessary for his glory. Amen. Thank you so much, Tom. I'm going to piggyback on what the pastor said just a moment ago. <clears throat> in fact, his testimony gave me coaching. He said he does not. If God didn't do another thing for him, he has done enough. Right, Pastor? We know that God is worthy to be praised no matter what he does for us. I mean, what else could he do for us to start with? Hmm? We were dropping, discouraging. We were totally lost without Jesus Christ. So we praise him and we thank him. We're going through a kind of a rough time right now, my family is, because my son and his son 
my grandson, still has not worked but one day in two weeks. Now, I know God has a plan. My faith has not wavered one bit. But my son and my grandson are worried, you know. I had one point of, like, I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm not hearing anything. Well, it's not time to hear it yet, you know. You still got to trust God. <clears throat> so I'm just praising God for being who he is. He's worked miracles in my life, and I remember those miracles. I remember one just the other day, I was stopped at a traffic light on uh, East West Connector and 120, and uh, the light turned green on my side, so I started to go, my car wouldn't go. It would not go. I can't press the gas. It would not go. And by that time, my car whizzed through the traffic light and would have killed my grandson, which is sitting right beside me in the front seat. I was the first car at that traffic light. We would have gotten killed. That man was, or the person was going so fast and just flew through that red light. So I say, I look back on things like that and I'm thinking, really? You watched over us back then and you're the same today. You never change. We're the one that changed, okay? So God is merciful. He's abundant in mercy. His mercies are new every morning. And I think about that every morning when I wake up. <clears throat> You're merciful today. Your grace is sufficient. Everything that we need, you have provided. So I just want to praise him for all that he has done and what he's planning on doing. Because he will never leave us in the shape that he found us. And I just praise God for that. Now, do we have any any more praise reports before we go to prayers? Do we have any spoken prayers? Yes, um, I'd like to pray for a group and who works with me. Um, he has a young, a pretty box at the gas station or wherever, and lose all his money. So I ask the prayer that the Lord will take that away from him. I also want to keep in prayer Ruben's son, um, who is an adult but doesn't do anything and he become a burden to his father. Um, I don't know what is his name. I can't remember. Okay, but keep his son. Yeah. Good morning, church. I would like for you to keep my friend, um, Cassetta, and her mother, Miss Williams, in prayer. Um, I want them to kind of help her. So it's, it's, it's hard when you have to take care of your parents and then you're moving and you have to turn them and clean them and do things. So um, it's Something you know, it's like a new experience, like taking care of a big baby. So, but um, continue to be aware, give her patience, and um, comfort her spirit as well. What is the daughter's name? Cosetta. Cosetta. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, be with Peggy, Peggy Case, as she go through her treatment to pray for her and her family and pray for my family as well. Uh, can the, my mother has two friends who are, uh, they go to two different churches and both of these women, they actually have a ministry where they feed those in need. And unfortunately, both of these women, they're renting spaces in, in two different churches, and the people from the church are stealing the food. So uh, I told them I would lift them up in prayer. Uh, I just say, Helen's friends, um, I pray that God will give the people who are stealing purposely a change of heart, and that he will protect those women's ministries as he sees fit. Amen. Just very quickly, um, my mom is going to be having surgery on the 4th of April for our sciatica. So I'm just soliciting continued prayers on her behalf. Thank you. And I'd like to keep myself and my mother in prayer. Um, I have a back procedure on the 31st of March. Um, I ask for your prayers for that. And then my mom has a back procedure uh, two days later. Uh, so I'll keep prayers for both of us. 
Okay, what about silent as you want to keep just between you and God and lift your hand? Because he sees hearts and he reads minds. So let's bow at this time and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Mm -hmm. over us in times and places that we will never know about until we get to heaven. And we want to praise you and thank you for that. Lord, we have a list here. Helen with the pain in her hand. Reuben and his son. Lord, convictions are so hard to overcome. But you say we can do all things through you who gives us the strength. So I pray that you will give Reuben the strength to stop the gambling and be with his son and give him more desire to get out and get a job and help his father. Lord, we thank you for Mrs. Williams and her daughter, Cassetta. Lord, you spared uh, Mrs. Williams' life to see another day. And Lord, there's a time to be born and a time to die. You have a reason why she is still here. And we thank you for the opportunity to be able to minister to her and her uh, daughter give her the strength to continue to help take care of her. And Lord Peggy Case, you have been so gracious and merciful to her. I had lunch with her yesterday, and her attitude is still praise to Jesus, and we thank you for that. The family, all of our families, Lord, <laughs> we've got people that never mention your name. I know they know about you, do they trust you and really know you? No, they know about you. So I pray that you will send your Holy Spirit to each one of our family members. Lord, heaven would not be the same without our family. So do all you can to save them. I know you'll never take their choice away from them. And Lord, Jerry was talking about <clears throat> the two families of Helen, their friends that are, people are still in the food that they're using to help other people. Lord, you're the Holy Spirit is the one that convicts us. And I pray for a special conviction on the people that's taking this food from <clears throat> the needy families. Speak to their hearts, Lord, and help them to realize that what they're doing is not only sinning against you, but it is taken away from people that really do need this product. And Lord, I pray that you will bless Karen if she is continuing to heal and be with her, I know that she's got some uh, physical problems. And Lord, PJ and her mom, just bless them as they go through their surgeries also. And Lord, I pray that you will bless our pastor today. He has a heavy message that he'll be speaking to our hearts about, but I pray that your Holy Spirit will touch each one of us and help us to understand what this uh, sermon is about. And not to be judgmental, but to be loving and kind to the ones that need you the most. 
We love you. We praise you. And thank you for hearing our prayer. Because we know you're going to answer according to your wishes. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. It is now time for a scripture reading. Please stand and join me um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. I will read in your hearing. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. This is the reading of his word. Praise the Lord. We uh, take our tithe and our offerings in the little box back in the back as you leave. And good morning to our online guests today, too. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful service with us today. Our speaker today is our very own Pastor Richard McNeil, and he will be speaking to you after our special music. We'll now have our special music by Sister Donna. Praise the Lord. This is a little side note. Sister Pat, you must have known what I was going to sing today. <laughs> <laughs> Is my faithfulness, O oh God, my Father? There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions with me. Yes. 
Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Also, want to say Happy Sabbath. Also, want to say Happy Sabbath to those that are watching online. Thank you for joining us. We're continuing with our series on sexuality this morning. We're going to be diving into a very, very important topic. Very, very important topic. But before we go any further, I invite you, especially those that are watching the line, please let us take a moment. Let's seek the Lord in prayer. Let us all pray together. Heavenly Father, we need you. Speak to us. Challenge us. Confront us. Transform us in this moment. Lord, we desire to leave this place different from how we came. We desire to experience you. So, Father, as we approach your word, prepare our hearts and mind. Help us to be receptive. Help us to be obedient. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to imagine with me. Imagine you have a friend and this friend comes, calls you up and invites you out to lunch. They tell you they have something very, very important that they want to share with you. Something big that they have to tell you. As you arrive, you're there at lunch, you're sitting across from the table from them. You can tell that they're nervous. Their hands are sweaty. Notice that as you're sitting, they're a little bit agitated in their seat. Their voice is shaking. They're looking you in the eye, kind of. You can tell something is not quite right. So you're like, okay, talk to me. What is it? What is it? Right? You can tell that they're nervous. They're hesitating. And they, they, they stutter. But they stutter out these words. I'm gay. What would your reaction be? Would it be shock? Would it be fear? Would it be confusion? Would it be condemnation? What would your reaction be? See, this scenario is meant to alert you to the reality that many are facing right now. This is a reality, a grown reality for especially the Generation Z. Almost 20% of Generation Z of Americans, which are those born between 1997 to 2003, they're now coming to adulthood and they're now identified as LGBTQ or gay. See, this could be the reality of the person sitting next to you. Could be your daughter, could be your son, could be your wife, could be your husband, could be your friend, your coworker, your neighbor. That one family member that you always, I wonder, See, for some, the state of these words could mean to state these words to anybody, to say, I am gay, it could mean you're no longer accepted. It could mean you're no longer respected. It could mean you're no longer welcome here. You're no longer loved. The emotional trauma that comes with admitting this reality causes deep anxiety and depression. It even causes deep thoughts of suicide. These words strike fear to the hearts of parents, of spouses, of friends. These words take years to muster the courage, the strength to openly admit. These words are some of the most dreaded, the most painful, the most anxiety-inducing words ever. I am gay. And this is not an issue that is going away. So please remove that from your thought. 
We have to address it, and we need to do it biblically. At least one agrees. See, unfortunately, some, you know, we've been educated on this issue of homosexuality, not from God's word, but rather from what we see in the world. From what we see in television shows, what we see on social media, what we see on websites, what we see and what we hear on podcasts. Like most aspects of sexuality, we don't actually talk about it openly, so we get our misinformation from the world. We rarely see God's word on the issue. We only know the cliche statements of condemnation that we heard one pastor say or one leader say at some point. In regards to homosexuality, we have been more educated by fear rather than truth. See, the ignorant use fear to teach because they have no other avenue in order to exercise influence. But God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and a sound mind. So we will be using that here this morning. See, growing up in the 1980s in the small isle of Jamaica, as a young man, I grew up in the church, and what I heard from leaders and all members around me was alarming. See, I, as I was growing up as a young child, there was a young man, I remember his name, his name was Valentine. He was the same age as my older brother, and I remember this very clearly. He was always a bit different. But I remember that the members of the church didn't know what to do. So the simple advice that was given to all of us as his friends, stay away from Valentine. But, 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 but he's, and my brother would say, but wait a minute, but he's my friend. What? Stay away from Valentine. It got to a point that eventually Valentine stopped coming to Pathfinder, stopped coming to AY, and eventually stopped coming to church. We would hear these on the hand comments Look at how he walked. I would hear these on the hand comments. Something is off with that man. I would hear these on the hand comments. What kind of name is Valentine? For men. These were statements. Notice it was not from the world. It was in the church. See, homosexuality is neither talked about. It's either not talked about. It's either ignored or it's just automatically just rejected. Don't talk about it. Ignorance has become the norm in the church. But I want you to understand something here this morning. Though God winks at our ignorance, he does not tolerate ignorance that comes due to prejudice and hatred. I want to make that abundantly clear. As a church, we need to care more about homosexuality and to learn the nuances that exist. Instead of a blanket hatred for something that we fear. So the question is, should the church affirm homosexual and gay lifestyle? Now, I want to stop here for a moment because often, as soon as I said those words, what might be going off in some of your minds, when you hear gay lifestyle, I want you to understand that there is a difference between a gay lifestyle for those in the world and a gay lifestyle for those that are gay Christians. Are you hearing me? For those that are in the world, when you say gay lifestyle, that means they're living very similar to those that are heterosexual. Gay clubs, bars, promiscuity, same sex, and this fluency and so forth. But that's not the same as Christian gay lifestyle. For Christian gays, they are advocating for a lifestyle that is loving, that is monogamous, committed relationships with someone but of the same gender. There is a difference. So the question now is, does the church have to affirm gay lifestyle in order to be loving? <laughs> Some churches that believe and teach a historic Christian sexual ethic often want to be healthy and inclusive of all people and include LGBTQ people, right? Now, a historic Christian ethic is that marriage is between one man and one woman only. I want to make that abundantly clear. Many churches struggle, though, 
to structure their corporate practices and communal life in a way that honors everyone equally. Watch the words. Listen carefully. For the last two decades, Pew Research Center has reported that one of the most enduring ethical issues across Christian traditions is sexual diversity. Are you hearing me? We struggle to show empathy and we struggle to show love. You say you love, but mm -mm. when you check the actions, doesn't match. We claim to be inclusive, yet we discriminate heavily <laughs> against those who we don't understand, especially LGBTQ. How can we as a church love and show compassion to those we don't fully understand? That is the big question. So the first thing that we need to understand is when you hear the word homosexuality, what is it? What is it? What is homosexuality? Now, a clear definition found in the Webster Dictionary says, it says, off or related to or characterized by sexual or romantic attraction to people of the same sex. That's what homosexuality is, different from heterosexuality. The adjective homosexual has been decreased in usage and is now sometimes considered a bit offensive. So I want you to be aware of that. The word tends to evoke negative stereotypes and outdated clinical understandings of homosexuality as a psychiatric condition. It is no longer considered that. The term that is largely used now to replace it is gay. Now, why do I spend the time to clarify that? So, brothers and sisters, as you're speaking to someone else, you know how to actually speak to them. You do not use slangs. Do not use the F word. If you don't know what that is, take a moment. Use the word gay. All right? Now, given the, the context, we're defining homosexuality, right? What does the Bible say about homosexuality? Does the Bible condemn someone based on what they are attracted to? That is a big question, amen? So I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles. We're going to, right where we had scripture reading, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. There's a lot of distractions here this morning, but that's all right. Stay with me. Let's be very, very diligent here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, as we look at these verses, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 11. Paul, he is speaking to Christian believers. He's speaking to the church. But he's speaking specifically regarding lawsuits between the members. Paul is speaking to the righteous believers, and he's speaking that they are seeking judgment or rulings from those who are unrighteous. And he's now describing, he says, listen, by their behavior, you can tell that they are not righteous. Notice what he says in verse 7. He says, now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to the law against one another. The mere fact that you're having disputes amongst each other, you're already failing. And the fact that you can't even resolve it amongst yourselves, mm, that's pretty sad. But not only that, you're not going to those among you, the church, to resolve it. You're now going to the civil authorities outside the church for help. Are you with me? It's important that you catch the context so you know how to properly exegete the rest of the passage. All right? Are we together? So now, let's look now. Notice verse 9. He says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. 
Notice how he starts. He says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Right? Now, he's describing them. Neither will the fornicators, the adulterers, the idolaters, sorry, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, or in some translation, they'll put the word homosexual there. But it's catamites, those submitting to homosexuals, nor sodomites. Some translation would say, will spell it out, abusers of themselves with mankind, or male homosexuals. Number 10, verse 10, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Notice the list. And notice what Paul is stating. Notice verse 11, it says, and such were some of you. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. Notice verse 9, it says, will not inherit Will not inherit what? The kingdom of God. Paul writes about the transformation that does occur when someone chooses to follow Jesus. People should not continue in their formal sinful way of life. Right? Notice he says, you were like this. You, that means you are no longer like this, so you do not seek judgment from those who are still living like this. Oh boy. Paul clarifies why believers should not attempt to settle disputes amongst themselves. Those outside of the faith community will not be part of God's kingdom. The description of the unbelievers in verses 9 to 10 reveals that their unrighteous character, by their unrighteous character, such persons are not qualified to judge God's holy people. They will not be a part of God's kingdom judging angels. He clarifies later, so they are not fit to judge you now. Paul's primary concern for the Corinth believers is that they do not continue to follow in the lifestyles of their culture. Paul describes, and notice now, he describes passive homosexual partners and dominant homosexual partners. The two related Greek words used here are malakos and arsenikoitis. Translated literally, malakos, soft or effeminate. The term was used to describe a, a person, often a young boy, in a passive role in same-sex relations. The second word is not as clear, but it could be used to refer to the dominant role in same-sex intercourse. The two terms function together to speak against same-sex sexual relations, okay? Paul uses the same terms in Romans chapter one, verses 26 and 27. Paul here in, 20, in Romans one, referring to female homosexuals and to male homosexuals, and he talks about the foul passions, right? These terms are alluding back to Leviticus 18 and 20 and refer to, notice, only refer to homosexual sexual activity as sinful. Did everyone catch that? Notice my words. I'm being very specific. Notice, let's look at Martin's reference now, Romans chapter 1, 26 and 27. It says, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. Vile passions is not the same thing as an attraction. A passion is a strong liking or desire for a same-sex attraction, right? Attra uh, I'm saying um, strong desire, that's a passion. Attraction is an action or power that's drawing to a response. Different things, right? So don't I don't want you to catch and say, oh, vile passions is the same thing as attraction, not the same. It says now, for even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, the men leaving the natural use of the woman burning their lust for one another. 
men with men committed, excuse me, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Paul here is speaking against specific behaviors to avoid. The Greek words that Paul uses are referring back to Leviticus 18. Notice Leviticus 18, 22, it says, you shall not lie a male with a male, lie with a male as with a woman. It, it is an abomination. Ver, notice Leviticus 20, verse 13. If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed abomination. I hope that you're catching the words. These texts speak only to the sexual acts and not a person's orientation. They have committed an abomination. They are not an abomination. The text does not say they are an abomination. It never says that. It is speaking about an innate attraction that someone, it is not speaking about an innate attraction that someone has. It says nothing about attraction. Are we together? It's very important that us as believers, we are biblically accurate. It says nothing about an attraction or an orientation. It simply states about a sexual act. Your orientation is not sinful. Whether it's heterosexual or homosexual. Your orientation is not a righteous or religious marker. <laughs> Nowhere in scripture does it say, if you are a woman, do not find other women attractive. Nowhere in scripture does it say, if you are a man, do not find other men attractive. Nowhere in scripture does it say that. We don't choose our orientation. We do, however, choose what to do with our orientation. <laughs> Your orientation may be heterosexual, but you still need to choose not to fornicate, not to commit adultery, not to rape others around you. Oh, you thought I was, I was only going to speak to homosexuals, right? No. The church struggle. This is where we struggle. We struggle when we're quick to condemn. A matter of fact, we struggle anytime we condemn. We're never called, we're not called to condemn people. Oh, let me, let me say that again for, the, for those online, those in the back. I hope you're hearing me now, last, nice and loud and clear. We are not called to condemn people. We are called to disciple people, baptize people, teach people, love people, be compassionate to people. That's what we're actually called to do. Someone being gay should receive love, our sympathy, our empathy, and not our condemnation, ever. No, oh, I don't think you're hearing me. Absolutely no one can be converted to Christ and his love if they are condemned by hate. We do more for the cause of Christ with love than we ever, than we ever could with condemnation. The church struggles when we condemn people as sin. A person is not sin. They may be a sinner, but not sin itself. Big difference. When sin is mischaracterized, we do great damage to those who are suffering, those who are struggling to be in the church. I want to make this abundantly clear. Heterosexuality is not the gospel. Did you hear me? 
is not the gospel. Many have accepted a heterosexual gospel in place of the real gospel of Jesus Christ. They have forgotten that the gospel is actually about Jesus and what he has already done and is doing in us. It is hopeless to believe you can be transformed by anything when who you need is Jesus, your creator himself. Heterosexuality is not the cure for homosexuality either. Homosexuality is simply a kind of sexuality and orientation. And it, in and of itself, is not sin. <laughs> heterosexuality, if not conformed to the will of God, can become sinful too. I want us to notice again the word of God. It says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? The word says, do not be deceived. It says, neither will the fornicators. That goes for hetero or homosexual. No idolaters, that goes for everybody. No for adulterers, that goes for everybody. No homosexuals, those are academites, those who submit themselves to other homosexuals. Nor sodomites, those who dominate others in homosexual activities. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Is not solo without any one people group. We're all in this together. We must be biblical in our definition of what sin is. Sin is the transgression of God's law. 1 John 3, 4. Sin is the deliberate violation of God's law of love. Romans 13, 8. Notice what Paul says next. He describes the sin issues. And he says, such were some of you. He did not say, and that's about them. He says, no, that was you. How dare you try to make you seem like you're better than them? But you were washed. But you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. You must be biblical in your definition of what salvation actually is. Salvation is in what Jesus has already done. Salvation is not in the fact that you're not of a homosexual orientation or of a heterosexual. You know, neither of those. God has called all of us to holy living. We are called to reflect the fruit of the Holy Spirit in all that we do, especially our sexuality. So what is the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5 tells us, Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. Is the fruit of the Spirit reflected in your relationship? Whether you're heterosexual, homosexual, asexual, bisexual, is the fruit of the Spirit reflected in your relationships? That is the question. I want us to notice the last one there. What was the last one? If it's King James temperance. What does temperance mean? In new self what? Self-control. See, those who have an attraction outside of heterosexuality have a difficult task. They're called to a deep level of self-control. Matter of fact, let me soften up a little bit. Who here remembers when you were growing up and you're a young child? And who here, here remembers when you decided, you said, you know what? I'm going to choose. You know what? I'm going to be attracted to girls now. Who, who here remembers doing that? You decided. You say, you know what? At this point forward, 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start being attracted to boys. Who here? Anyone? You have some, I see some puzzled look on your face. Like, I see the hell tilts. What's going on? See, that's the issue. You didn't actually choose. You didn't actually choose. It was an innate response. See, I sat with a young man, and he came and he's like, hey, Pastor, ah. Uh, and he was the, I'm gay. And he was expecting for me to kind of jump at him. And I said, okay. And he's like, you know, I don't think you heard me, Pastor. He says, I, I, I think I'm gay. I said, okay. He says, listen, listen, I'm, I'm, I tried, I prayed, I prayed about it, and I, I tried to get rid of it. I'm not choosing this because I, I, I can't even let my parents know. Because if, if I tell them, I know they're going to flip out. But, but what should I do? What should I do? He says, I didn't choose this, Pastor. I didn't choose this. I said, I believe you. He was, he was shocked. He said, you do? I said, I do. I believe you. The, the sense of relief that fell over his countenance, that fell over his face. Oh, I said, I believe you. Talk to me. He began and he shared his story. I want you to understand, this is not easy. It is important that we understand their orientation is not simply what they have chosen. It's simply their inclination. This young man, he shared his story. He's like, listen, if I could choose, I would choose anything, not this. I don't want this. Because he knew his family background. He knew his church background. He says, if I could choose any, I would gladly. But it's, he's like, I can't, there's nothing I can do about it. I want us to understand how much those that identify as gay deserve our sympathy, our empathy, and our love. They deserve it. Thank you, my dear sister, just like everybody else. LGBTQ youth are highly at risk of being bullied, of family rejection, of homelessness, and even suicide. And all, hear me now, hear me now, and all of these risk factors, the church can reduce. The church can address every single one of them. The church can fix every single one of them. Every single one. We must be sensitive to the reality of the high risk the high rates of homelessness and suicide among our gay brothers and sisters. See, I want us to understand that Jesus mingled with and ministered to all who were outcasts. Those who are gay are often outcasts. And that should never be the case amongst those that say they're, they're believers. We are called to love as Jesus loved. We too must be concerned with the real needs of those of the LGBTQ. Many, like I've stated, they've been bullied, beaten, they've even been killed. A recent survey shows that 34% of men and 24% of lesbians have experienced physical violence. 73% of those who identify as gay have been verbally abused. That's not okay. Gay people have not felt welcome in our churches and have often been the victims of gossip and demeaning jokes. Some have been expelled from Christian schools when they revealed their attraction to the same sex. 
Most, if not all, have heard sermons that condemn homosexuals as persons, failing to distinguish between a homosexual, the attraction or the orientation different from homosexual acts. I hope that today you've learned the big difference between the two. God does not, he's not against gays. He's not hating gay people. He says specifically about the sexual actions. We stand against any hatred towards homosexuals, as well as any cultural biases that fuel a lack of Christ-like love toward them. The church needs to provide more intentional Hear me now, more intentional ministries directed toward gay and lesbian persons. We have an obligation to minister to their needs. We should be aware of how easily we might fall into the self-righteous judgmentalism. Brothers and sisters, we are in this together. When Paul wrote Romans chapter 1, he was not saying, see them. No, he was saying, see us. And all are in need of Jesus Christ and his salvation. How can we as a church love and show compassion to those who don't fully understand? That's the question I asked you earlier. Here it is. We can make sure that amongst us, there is no condemnation of the individual. Absolutely none. We're not trying to force the person to change. Oh, I don't think you heard me. We are not trying to force the person to change. We're recognizing this is your issue. A change in their orientation may not be possible or necessary. We do not condemn the individual. We disciple the person to love Jesus. We follow Jesus' example as he interacted with open sinners. We see a great example in John chapter 8. Jesus said to the woman that was called the adultery, neither do I what? Condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Because she was participated in the sinful actions. Are you catching it? Yeah. Don't partake in the sinful actions anymore. But go your way. I'm not condemning you. In the book, Welcoming But Not Affirming by author Stanley Drenz, he says, we must show the same character of God depicted in the Bible, who is infinitely knowing intimately caring and invincibly loving. Oh, to be a part of a church that is described this way. See, while being fruitful and faithful to the biblical teaching of sexuality, that marriage is between one man and one woman only, notice marriage is between one man and one woman only, we must also seek to understand and empathize with the struggles and challenges that face those who are gay. Get to know those who are gay. Ask questions, brothers and sisters. Listen and learn. Dismiss this quick judgmentalism. Do not condemn the individual. Disciple the person simply to love Jesus. The washing, the sanctifying, the justifying, that's not your job. It was Jesus that washed you. So why are you trying to wash others? Stay in your lane. Disciple the individual to just love Jesus. That's it. If the Lord desires for them to change, he will state it to the person. And if the Lord desires for the person to stay the same, he, that's his prerogative, not yours or mine. Get off your religious high horse. Who put you as God? Uh, oh, idolater. That's what Romans is all about. Notice it. Every single time before Paul lists and speaks of homosexuality in any form, he first hits with idolatry. Look at the text again. 
Did you notice it? It's the issue of putting yourself as God or worshiping anything other than the true God. Brothers and sisters, as believers, let us not put ourselves as God. Who's judge, jury, and executioner? We do not condemn the individual, disciple the person to love Jesus. There are some who recognize that they are gay, but choose to live in celibacy. They do not engage in romantic or sexual relationships with someone of the same gender. This is where the church is needed. This is where the church has to take action. Help is needed to foster healthy companionship, loving, loving friends that will help and combat loneliness and isolation. See, when churches are actually healthy, someone being a homosexual doesn't even matter. Oh, okay, so you are, don't worry about it. We're still here with you. And the church rallies around them, is loving on them so much that they don't even miss the fact that they don't have a husband or a wife. Mm, no, 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 no. See, we often, we often have, we have singles ministry. You ever notice that we have singles ministry and we have marriage ministries. Where's the homosexual ministry? Without even noticing it, we have elevated heterosexual norms as the righteous standard. Do we see that in scripture? No. Even Paul says, says, I wish that many of you would have the same gift that I have of celibacy. He's not even encouraging marriage. I want you to understand my word of encouragement to anyone who recognizes that they are gay. Understand this. Being gay is part of the human condition. You are not sin. You are not an abomination. The unholy sexual acts are what God hates, not you. Big difference. The scriptures, I want to make it abundantly clear, the scriptures do condemn sexual acts outside of marriage. That's called fornication. And that goes for everybody regardless of your orientation. Scriptures speak against sexual acts between humans and animals. That's bestiality. That goes for everybody. Sexual acts with the same gender. That's homosexuality. That goes for everybody. Sexual acts against consent. If someone says no, and you still engage, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual, God is against that. That's called rape. Sexual acts with minors. That goes right across the board. That's pedophilia. God is against that. Sin as well. But the scriptures do not condemn you, the person. Scriptures condemn always the actions, not for the person. Because if, God, if scriptures condemns the person, then none of us can be saved. Those who practice these things, Paul says, will not inherit the kingdom. Just because someone is gay doesn't mean they have to ascribe to heterosexual norms either. Marriage, family, children, that's not for everybody. There's some people, oh please, don't go great. See, I understand the need and desire for companionship and relationships and love. All of those desires Yes, those need, they're natural, they're good, they're healthy. Yes, oh yes. Though family and marriage and companionship are good, they may not be a sign for you. It's not for everyone. Marriage, oh mercy, is not for everyone. Though it can be good, it can be a living nightmare. I, I hope y'all hear me. I want you to understand this, and I say this with all due respect. For many, understand that your homosexual orientation may be a blessing from God. Celibacy may be an option for you. author and 
public speaker, Jackie Hill Perry, she wrote this book. It's entitled Gay Girl, Good God. And she had this to say. She says, our sexuality is not our soul. Marriage is not heaven. And singleness is not hell. So may we all preach the news that is good for a reason. For it proclaims that the world, proclaims to the world that Jesus has come so that all sinners, same sex attracted and opposite sex attracted, can be forgiven of their sins to love God and enjoy him forever. Oh, she didn't stop there. She continues out this another quote. She says, Jesus said that there will be no marriage in the new creation. In that respect, we will be like the angels, neither marrying nor being given in marriage. We will have the reality we will no longer need the signposts. By foregoing marriage now, singleness is a way of both anticipating this reality and testifying to its goodness. It's a way of saying this future reality is so certain that we can live according to it right now. If marriage shows us the shape of the gospel, singleness shows us its sufficiency. Oh, I hope you're catching what I'm saying. It's a way of declaring to a world obsessed with sexual and romantic intimacy, these things are not ultimate. And that in Christ we possess what is. Being a believer of Jesus is characterized by sacrifice and obedience to his principles, regardless of your sexual orientation. Whether you are heterosexual or homosexual orientation, unless your sexuality is under the authority of Jesus Christ himself, it is already flawed. We are called to be obedient disciples, not based on our preferences, but on his love towards us. Do not make heterosexuality and its norms your new God. Please don't do that. We must be careful not to over-characterize heterosexual orientation or any orientation as though it is holy. I want to take a moment to address very quickly here some questions that are often raised. The Seventh day Adventist Theological Seminary released a position paper, and this was voted October 9, 2015. It has these words Did God make me this way? And if so, why? Here's the answer. Most researchers state that many factors contribute to same-sex attraction and homosexual orientation. Some persons describe their attraction to the same sex as being among their earliest memories and contend that they would not have chosen the painful experience of being gay or lesbian. Simplistic answers to the why question should be avoided at all costs. But we should be clear that all evil in this world is a consequence of the fall into sin. Stop trying to act like you know the reason why. There are many factors, biological and otherwise. Notice the next question. If God made me this way, can he change me? Recent literature denies the possibility that gay and lesbian persons can be changed, and even claims that change attempts are harmful. Did everyone catch that? Forcing an individual to try to change, like, come on, you gotta pray the scale, you gotta fast it. No, 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 it does mental and emotional damage to the person. Stop. That's not the role of the church or otherwise. Teach them to love Jesus, let the Lord watch as he sees fit. 
Does change mean that all same-sex attraction disappears? Some who are now in monogamous heterosexual marriages report that they still experience homosexual attractions, but that they choose not to act on them. Others have pleaded with God to change them and have submitted to therapy with the goal of change, but have not been changed. They have accepted their same-sex attraction as their lifelong reality and have chosen a life of celibacy. Working through this process, whatever the result, can be extremely difficult. So we are called to be sympathetic and empathetic. Another question. If I accept myself as gay or lesbian person, do I have a place in the church? We are a church made up of sinners saved by grace with love and its foundation. And such love should be shown equally to all members. Gay and lesbian members who choose to and remain abstinent should be given the opportunity to participate in all church activities, including leadership positions in the church. I hope that today's message is clear. We do not discriminate against anyone based on their sexual orientation. At least one amen. I want to clear up, I see the time, I want to clear up two misconceptions about gay and lesbian persons before I close. Often it's stated they're sinners. Therefore, they must not love God. In reality, that is not true. Some gay and lesbian persons are passionately in love with God. A good number of gays consider themselves to be Christians and claim to have meaningful personal commitment to Jesus Christ. They, they may have vibrant spiritual lives, and have wrestled with God about their sexual identity and have drawn close to him despite their struggles. We should reflect the compassion of Jesus Christ who never condemned a struggling person but helped everyone to live a life of holiness. Here's another one. This is often stated. They don't want to be a part of, Sem of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is not true. Yes, although it is true that many Seventh-day Adventist gay and lesbian persons have been hurt by the church, and some have chosen to leave as a result, many love the church and its teachings and want to be a part of it. Many have grown up in the church, participate in pathfinders, in our Adventist schools, and believe in the beliefs and the culture of the Seventh-day Adventist church and want to be a part of them. They want and need a home in which they can be welcomed, accepted, even though their sexual orientation is different. In closing, I just want to say this. There is hope. There is hope. Notice again what Paul says in verse 11. He says, and such were some of you. But, I love the word but. Because it cancels everything that came before. The fornicators, the adulterers, the homosexual, the effeminate, and whatever description of those sinful actions, guess what? But you are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified. Notice, Paul does not say you were washed because you did this. 
He did not say you were washed because you got your act together and you start saying that you're no longer same sex attracted. He did not say you were washed because all of a sudden you stopped telling lies. He did not say none of those things. He says you were washed. He then said you were sanctified. You were cleansed. You were made holy. Really? Yes, you were. Not because of anything that you did or said or changed your actions or anything. You were sanctified. You were then justified. Oh, my, my. So I stand as a holy, righteous saint before the Lord? Yes, you do. How? I'm still struggling with different things. I'm still struggling with self-control. I'm still struggling. List all the fruits of the Spirit. I struggle with every single one of them. How is it that I stand justified? Here's the hope. It says you are washed. You are sanctified, you are justified in the name of someone else. In the name of Jesus, and not only the name, and by the Spirit of our God. We are in this together. Heterosexuals are not better than homosexuals. Heterosexuals need Jesus just as much as homosexuals. In order to understand those who are gay, we must seek them out, listen to them carefully, and cut out the judging. By what measure you judge others, mercy Lord, you will be judged the same way. So if you say, you know what, burn them. I grew up hearing that from pulpits. The same judgment is on you, my dear brother. The same judgment is on you, my dear sister. See, if you say judge them, burn them, kick them out, guess what? That's the same thing that's being done to you. And not just here on earth, but in the kingdom of God. So cut out the judgments. I want us to catch this now. And why she wrote this in Ministry of Healing, she says, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching gay people. Jesus mingled with gay men and gay women as one who desired their love and good. He showed his sympathy for gay men and gay women and ministered to the gay needs and won their confidence and then he bade them, gay brother, gay sister, follow me. So the question is, brothers and sisters, are you willing to love those who are gay among us? Are you willing to show empathy for those who are gay among us? When you understand that they are outcast, how is it that it doesn't break your heart? I read the nonsense being posted online by those who claim to be sent their menace. What Jesus are you following? Our gay brothers and sisters need us. Don't condemn the individual. Disciple the person to simply love Jesus. But you know what the problem is? You can't do what you don't know. You can't disciple others to love God if you don't love God. All persons, including, including those that are even practicing the sexual acts of homosexuality should be made to feel welcome to attend our church services. Did I say that loud enough? Whether you're practicing or not practicing, practicing homosexuality, you should be welcome right here. Come. I ain't gonna judge you, come. The same way if you are a drunkard, the same way if you're struggling with whatever addiction, whatever malady, whatever sin problem in this world, you are welcome in the house of God. Because I read the same scriptures and I realize, oh, wait a minute, Jesus said it, F, it's sinners. And don't you dare misquote Paul because Paul clears it up. He says, wait a minute, I wasn't saying don't ever eat with sinners. He said, don't eat with hypocrites. Those who claim to be righteous follow the will of God, but guess still they're devious. Conniving sinners that will stab you in the back. He says, from those, stay away. Isn't that common sense, brothers and sisters? For your own safety, he said, listen, don't even, don't, don't turn your back 
on them. You can't trust them because they're hypocrites. They say one thing, but they're really conniving wolves. Wait to victimize you. So don't you dare bring that here because Paul cleared it up already in chapter 5. In chapter 6 that we're talking about here, we're talking about loving those who are homosexual. And God is always saying, that act, I don't like the act. I love the person. Do not condemn anyone. Disciple all to love Jesus. Jesus will wash them. Jesus will sanctify them. Jesus will justify them just like he did for you. So the question is, and this is the appeal, are you willing to lovingly disciple others to Jesus? Even those who are gay. Praise God. Praise God. And for those watching online, I hope that your response is, yes, I will lovingly disciple those who are gay. I will disciple them to love Jesus as I love Jesus too. See, this is our commitment here at the Sweetwater Seventh Day Adventist Church. I stand on this. I will die on this mountain if need to. This is our commitment as a church. We disciple all to love Jesus. We do not discriminate against anyone. I don't care what your orientation is. I care about you. I love you. Because the Lord saving me, he never once asks, Richard, what is your orientation? He called me into a loving relationship with him. I've heard the response. And I hope and pray of those watching online, your response is similar. Because we live in a day and age where victimizing and outcasting others has become the norm, even amongst those who claim to be followers of God. And the only way you'll be able to tell the remnant different from the mass of people claiming to be followers of Christ is to look to see that it will know that you are my disciples by the love that you have for one another. These are the signs of the times when people lack the love of God. This is why it will become so easy to kill another person simply because they don't worship like you do. Do you see it? If you can discriminate so easily based on someone else's orientation because of what someone else does in the privacy of their own bedroom, if you can hate someone for that and victimize them for that, you will very easily be able to do it based on what day and what time they worship. Note the attitude and the lack of love. Brothers and sisters, now more than ever before, we have to be spending time in God's word. We have to be spending time in God's presence. The sign of the believers of God are those that follow after the Lamb wheresoever he goes. We're living in a day and age where everybody has a voice now. Everybody's speaking, and very few are hearing the voice of God. I praise God for our stand as believers that we will lovingly disciple those who are gay and otherwise into a love relationship with Jesus. Let us pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for washing us, for sanctifying us, for justifying us in your name and by your Holy Spirit. We condemn no one. Recognizing that we too are in need of your grace and of your mercy. Lord Jesus, help us to be sympathetic. Help us to empathize with the struggles of others. Help us to be a loving church community 
Help us to establish ministries that will minister to those who are gay. Forgive us for neglecting them. Forgive us for hating them. Oh, Father, we're simply saying we're sorry. We were ignorant, we were fearful, we did not know. But from this point forward, we will love actually. We will care meaningfully. And we will minister lovingly. We ask all these things in your beautiful name, by which we are saved. Please join us for our closing song, page 318, Whiter Than Snow. Please stand. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. Thank you all.